it's Heidi Fisher here with Make an Impact TV and today I'm joined by Craig Carey from Bubble Chamber. Hi Craig, nice to see you. Hi Heidi, nice to, nice to see you again. Thank you. Um, Craig, could you just tell me a little bit about what you do and what Bubble Chamber is as well please? So, Bubble Chamber, uh, we're, we're a social enterprise, we're a community interest company, which I founded with my business partner, Ben Friedman, about four and a half years ago now. Uh, basically, we are business coaches and we work with CEOs from a range of different social enterprises, social businesses, in order for them to grow their social impact. Okay. Um, in terms of your background, what, what kind of things were you up to before you founded Bubble Chamber? Uh, I've had a very varied work back, working background. I've, uh, I started off in my career working with a large high street bank uh, where I specialised in insolvency, uh, which taught me about how a business should or shouldn't, shouldn't be run. Um, basically, my... Although I learned a lot from working in the bank, it, the value set and my value set didn't really match too much. So I moved out of there and I went and studied A for an MBA, uh, worked for a group of investors setting up small businesses, particularly around the youth sector and education. Um, from now, became interested in international development and spent a couple of years working in Africa. Uh, working with a large local NGO, uh, building rice mills, maize mills, peanut processing plants, everything to help those uh, organisations move from the primary to the secondary phase of production. I came back to the UK and spent a lot of time working with charities in an organisation called Pilot Light, where we must have written over 40, 45 strategic plans. Uh, with charities and social enterprises but where Pilot Light was unique it brought in the best of the corporate talents from your Barclays, Ernst and Young etc etc sort of so I was very fortunate position where I got to work with some great CEOs but also uh, worked with the cream of the crop from the corporate world which as I say was a great learning experience for me um, but whilst I was at Pilot Light, I started to come across more social enterprises, this thing called social enterprise, uh, which sort of match my sort of social heart values alongside um, sort of my business brain and background and strategy. And therefore, spent five great years at Social Enterprise UK, a national body for, this, for the sector, where I learned a heck of a lot about the various different elements of, of the sector from a strategic view, but also well, involved in quite a lot of consultancy, running events, etc. And then, I'd say about four and a half years ago, I decided to take that leap, follow my entrepreneurial spirit, and set up my own social enterprise to deliver business coaching and consultancy support for the sector. So wow. that's a very brief <laughs> journey. Yeah. You, you sound like you've done a lot over the years. Um, and with all that knowledge and experience that you've gained along the way, um, what would you say are the biggest barriers to growth for social enterprises? Wow. So the biggest biggest barriers so there's probably there's a couple that uh, uh, immediately pop into my head uh, and then this is in no particular order is I suppose access to patient capital would be one there's a lot of sort of social finance investment that's talked about now but I believe it's that uh, sort of rates that are not really that inviting to the organization the depth a lot of debt finance is possibly not needed at different at the particular stage of growth for that organization that they need 
sort of long-term investment and that's where the sort of patient capital comes in a number of years allowing that organization to grow become sustainable and then start paying paying the finance back so yeah patient capital is definitely one uh number two is still i suppose the customer perception and understanding of what social enterprise is it's still one of those things if you were having a drink down the pub with your friends and trying to explain what a social enterprise is and then getting to understand it that and how many different definitions there are of social enterprises out there so i think there's still a lot of work to be done about uh public perception mm -hmm. but I, I can see over the last sort of five ten years that's has actually improved mm. quite a lot of us think there's still a way to go there i think a third key area is how we recruit and develop talent and i'm sure there'll be a few questions yeah about that, given ask you about that um in a moment um, yeah so there's sort of talent development and I suppose fourth is about this conundrum about how do we really prove measure what we do in terms of social impact measurement measuring our social value that is clearly understood by all the different stakeholders involved and I suppose partially an eye on the sort of commissioners out there in terms of they want to sort of have limited resources want to drive down the contract values and and how they really need to make pay attention to the value that such enterprises are creating and actually that will actually save money in the long term but yeah it, social enterprise and social impact is probably similar in terms of the probably about a million different ways to measure social impact and people's understanding is probably quite low so those, those yeah. are sort of four things that pop into my head fair enough yeah so obviously um social impact is one of my my favorite ever yeah. subjects yeah well, i mean um, what's what's what do you think about those four points what any agree disagree or um, add to yeah that? I, I was i would agree with um all four of those i'd um perhaps also um add something which is um is something i know we've talked about before around um the conflicts around uh, a leader's vision and the the social enterprise and where that evolves and goes um so more of an internal um, barrier to growth perhaps in, in terms of what what the leader's expectations are um, which um, is probably another one but um, yeah definitely all of those things are, are huge barriers um, and there's, there's a lot of um, campaigning and policy changes that need to happen to alter a lot of that I think um, so is that going to be one of your roles in the future? <laughs> I, if it's the policy development, I, I will leave that the policy to the experts in terms of helping the social entrepreneurs and leaders on their journey, then yes, definitely at their at the front line. Yeah. So um you mentioned about um talent, um, and as you rightly said, I would come back to that. Um because I know that's um one of the areas that you um focus in on. Um so what are the main issues that uh, occur around talent and what is talent because um, quite a few people um, probably don't call talent talent <laughs> yeah so um, I suppose I just like step back with the CEO in terms of we're trying to enable CEOs to get the clarity that they need in order to grow their social impact and we find clarity is it comes into sort of three key areas one around clarity of leadership and that's sort of 
starts with the leader themselves and clarity around their personal purpose. What's the passion? What's the work-life balance they want to have? What are their big goals? What's money that they need to earn? Once the leader is clear on themselves, it's clarity under this leadership piece is the, what's the organizational purpose, vision and values and being crystal clear on that and then ensuring everyone else is crystal clear around that piece. And under leadership is, as well as sort of clarity around market position, who really is the customer, what is their need, and how is what you're doing solving that need? Not just what you think that, how it solves it, but actually asking the customer and understanding that that piece so that's the sort of clarity around the leadership piece then there's a sort of the clarity around strategy so for us every organization has five sort of core strategies marketing sales operations finance and talent and obviously being a social enterprise it has the whole social impact piece that goes across those areas but for, for us it's talent is actually having the right people in the right place at the right time in order to grow and drive your organization often your talent your people in the organization is actually what in a competitive market is actually what your usp is against other organizations and when we refer to talent strategy it's sort of strategy is a plan to achieve a big result but for the so it's what talent do we need in place to achieve our overall purpose vision and values of the organization and it's sort of the strategy is obviously made up what's our recruitment what's our retention plan and what's our staff development plan. Often or not, within an organization, it's talent is referred to as sort of human resources, personnel, and which for me, I see in a lot of organizations, HR is sort of more of a policing processes type function, whereas actually, if it's our greatest asset, our talent, that we actually need to develop, retain that talent, which will ultimately drive better results for us. And then the third bit of the jigsaw around clarity, we've got clarity of leadership, clarity of strategy, clarity of execution, is we spend a lot of time doing these strategic plans, but actually how do we get it executed? And we talk about what's our sort of developing core habits of enterprise and a sort of culture around effective communication, planning, productivity, measurement, making sure everyone's at ease with numbers, I'm going to say. Wow. That's, that's, bit of a, that's probably a bit of a long-winded answer to what you... <laughs> that sounds like a lot <laughs> in there. Uh, around, um, just going in the back of the talent thing, what you've described there in terms of you know, recruiting and retention and having actually a, a role that, that's focused on developing the talent, um, I don't see very many social enterprises that have that focus in their, in their internal teams. Mm. It's very often it's the, the chief exec or somebody else has that as part of their function and it's not their, necessarily their main role. Mm. Um, so, um, would you be saying that it's you need a dedicated person or um you know how how do people approach it where they don't have that resource to have a dedicated person so i think the first thing is whether they have a dedicated person or not is is a bit of a mindset change in terms of moving from policing whether they're off 
sick or whether they've done everything they should have done in an employee handbook in terms of actually I've got this great asset who brings these skills, strengths, attitude to the table to the table, how can I actually develop these people? Mm. And it's about making a commitment also to investing in your talent. And if you're able to measure what the re investment is, what the return on investment, and not just see it as a cost, a cost line in terms of, I have to send X, Y, and Z off on a, on a training course, but actually if I invest in them, what the benefit that will be to sort of the bottom line financially, but also what additional social impact will I be able to create from that? So as I say, it's a mindset shift, but it's also potentially an investment that, it's foolish not to make mm. it's one of the things that doesn't get measured in terms of if you look at your staff turnover associated with that is if you're losing people in the business the amount of time and training that might have gone into them the cost of the recruitment process time out for people to take that to actually take part in the recruitment process. I mean, for every person you lose, I mean, there's lots of different figures out there, but someone just on a 25 to 30,000 pound salary is 40,000 plus cost to the business every time you replace somebody. Obviously, if it's a yeah. director, higher level, that cost yeah. goes up, but it's something that's not actually measured that much in the, in the sector so mm -hmm. it could be quite easy to come up with actually if we invest we we'll actually save ourselves money in the long term and it's about creating a an engaged workforce mm -hmm. that should all buy into your purpose and vision and values that you've set up mm -hmm. yeah it, it almost reminds me a little bit of um some of the more traditional charities that have um, funded programs and they just keep their staff forever even when the funding is, is finished and just put them into different roles and we're actually you're what you're saying is actually we need to be more focused as to where should those people be used and how can their skill set be best used rather than just keeping people on forever in roles that aren't necessarily right for them any longer yeah, so I mean, I so say we talk about the right people in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And you'll know about organisations at different stages of their growth that you require different skill sets at different stages. And it could almost come back to the CEO or founder is great on one level of growth, but maybe the CEO or founder might not have the right skill sets to take it to the next level and that's where you have obviously the succession planning. Mm, definitely. So one of the other things that um, quite often comes up in social enterprises is that the, there are um, conflicts or issues between the leader and the board or um, sometimes between the senior management team and the, the chief exec. So um, how, how can that be resolved? So I think Ultimately, it perhaps comes back to this starting point of clarity around the purpose, vision and values mm -hmm. of the organisation. Board, CEO, senior leadership team need to be, have an understanding of the direction everyone's going in and how we sort of behave on the way. Conflict or normally comes out of when there's a misalignment somewhere of our values or understanding. And it's about, it comes back to, say, getting the right people 
the right stage at the right time. But it's all we often talk about hiring for attitude rather than skills is having the right skills you can teach people attitude you can't is when you recruit to the board or recruit to the senior leadership team you start with attitude first which then helps drive the culture and then as i say potentially if skills are needed you can teach skills along the way i don't know what's what's your thoughts and experiences um definitely um attitude and um culture um has to be led from the top and you know if, if you've got a senior management team that have got bad attitudes and um are not adhering to the values of the organization then that, that will spread throughout the whole organization um and yeah it's it's bound to to lead to more conflict more difficulties um the organization won't grow etc so yes definitely definitely agree with that um i mean it ultimately comes down to leadership if mm. if the leaders don't practice the values trying to develop themselves have a growth mindset then how can you expect the rest of the organization and talent to do do the same if you're not prepared to put in the effort as a leader yourself yeah i think it's it's about um where well, you're talking about your your purpose and your vision and your values it's you know what what's the what does the brand stand for and you know how how do people operate if they're within that that brand and that organization and you know what behaviors are acceptable etc so a bit of the policing in some respects that we're trying to shift away from mm. um that then will enable the other better stuff to happen um if you've got the first stage right probably yeah and so for us when we're working with ceo in an organization it all starts with the purpose vision and values when, so once you know the direction of travel, then you can start to piece things together behind that. If you don't know where you're going or what you're doing, it's just like aimlessly driving around, sat down broke, and you might get somewhere at some stage, but who knows? But you probably run out of petrol before you get there. Nice. That's a, a nice analogy there. <laughs> um, so um, it, it sounds to me, Craig, like there's, there's a lot of different bits of the jigsaw puzzle that need to be fitted together to, to get a social enterprise growing. Um, what have you seen in your experience has been the main reason why a social enterprise will fail? That's a bit, that's a big question. Um, yeah. <laughs> again, the number of, Another th number of things that immediately pop into my head is around the first one is around the customer. Worked with a lot of organizations that when you ask them what's the actual problem or need that you're addressing, how do you know it's a need? How do you continue to know that over a long period of time in terms of obviously engaging the customer is organizations don't understand that customer enough mm -hmm. if you go into the commercial world people are able to clearly articulate a customer avatar give them a name have a profile for them exactly know what their needs are can target their marketing specifically for that, the whole creating a pipeline that goes into their sales process. They know exactly that. What's the, what's the customer journey that goes on through? What's the operational processes that happens behind that? It's all part of a system, but it's all customer focused. Whereas I think, sometimes 
social enterprises that go a bit awry lose track of the customer needs to be at the heart of everything and you're there to solve solve a need and a problem and it, I do you continue to do that over a long period of time I don't know if you have you had any experiences of seeing any organizations that might have taken their eye off the ball with the customer um some of them yeah I think they um often there's a, an assumption that um their services or or activities or, or programs are delivering specific outcomes and actually it's making this real difference to these people's lives and mm. then when when they do actually measure it they they're finding that actually they're not really doing what they say or what they think they're doing they're not having that big impact that they think they are and um it can come as quite a shock mm. <laughs> when they realize that actually what they're, they're doing isn't as impactful as they expected. <laughs> yes, no, especially what, what they're probably set up to do. Yeah. I think yeah. Um, another one is understanding of numbers and it's sort of feed into your accountancy previous background mm -hmm. as well, is not, there's not enough understanding and people having an eye on the numbers that makes it work as a social enterprise we're there to have this social impact and work with people but ultimately the business needs to be financially sustainable so there's some sort of commercial thinking but really being on top of your PL, cash flow understanding balance sheet and how all the numbers work because i mean again worked with a number of organizations particularly around sort of like public sector contract areas they go through this whole bidding tendering process get awarded a contract and then they go down into the final negotiations for the commissioners on the numbers and find out that they might have got a few of the sums wrong or forgot to add in some things to budget lines and suddenly they're having to make redundancies or something's not quite right in terms of being able to deliver the service that they thought they could doing because it's they just haven't been on top of those numbers again i'm not sure whether that resonates or not well um the, there's a lot of people that um are, are um leaders and, and running social enterprises and they they will often say i don't do numbers <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think um, the, the key message is that you have to do numbers. Yes. Whether, whether, you, whether you like them or not, you, you've got to have a basic understanding of, of what the numbers are telling you. You, may, you don't have to necessarily know everything in minutia and minute detail. Um, you know, there can be somebody else that you delegate that responsibility to, but ultimately you, you have to understand what the numbers mean and the, you know, what the future direction of travel is in terms of your numbers. So, I'm interested in your experience. What are the, what are the key things that seen organisations fail? I'm interviewing you, not the other way around. <laughs> Sorry, well, it's my, yeah, it's again, right. sometimes I go to natural coaching mode and asking yeah. questions. Yeah, you're just being um, cheeky. No, serious, in terms of what I've seen um, with make social enterprises failing is um, people not really being clear as to, to why they've set it up in the first place. So this, this links back to what you're saying about being clear about the purpose, you know, it, it often evolves from somebody had a nice idea um, one day, decided to do something and it's sort of grown organically and now it, it's got to the point where it's doing all kinds of random things and it's not really clear what it is. Um, I think the other issue is um, where the, the, but the founder wants to hold on to everything and not bring in other people in recognition of the areas of expertise where they don't have necessarily the right skills and um, the, the 
third one would, would be similar to you in terms of they didn't get their numbers right, they've underpriced, they've undercosted, um, they're always at break even or at a loss, so they're always struggling to, to get um, any movement in terms of what they're trying to do. Um, and ultimately, they'll eventually have significant cash flow problems and dire death that way. So, uh, on that cheerful note, <laughs> Sorry, can, I, can I just jump in on your <laughs> CEO point there? I think one of the things that sort of has become abundantly clear over the last couple of years for us is the CEO role and getting a good number two in place. If you look at any successful big commercial organization they've got a CEO is sort of the visionary big picture strategic type thinker but doesn't really do that much detail not a sort of completer finisher often when CEOs try and double in that area then you start to get things going wrong in the organization so you need and I know this is not a appropriate for some of the smaller organizations but you need a type of chief operations officer implementer get stuff done type role gets the detail but gets things done gets complete to finisher type and I think it's the matching of the CEO and their strengths big picture with a COO type role coming together will has a real positive impact on the effectiveness of the organization because they would say you start to get everyone playing to their different strengths mm. and it's also part of that transition and journey because when you you do initially start there is there's probably only resources for you as the founder to be there and as you you start to scale and grow you you do need to bring in other people that that can focus their energy on things otherwise you don't have enough time to be doing the bits that, that you've um, been doing up to that point anyway mm. so yes uh, interesting journey the social enterprise indeed it's not easy i mean who would who'd want to be it's hard enough being an entrepreneur who would want to be a social entrepreneur me, <laughs> yeah, <and> me. <laughs> yeah so just one final question before we finish um which is more a general question in terms of where do you see the social enterprise sector in 10 years time? Uh, well, I hope to see it in 10 years time is basically a lot more social enterprises out there. So, I mean, it links back to our overall vision uh for bubble chamber is that basically social enterprise gets to the oxford english dictionary there's a sector leader across the board is social enterprise it becomes the way of doing business i think we're probably a bit more than 10 years away from, from Don't know. <laughs> but it's, I, i'm definitely hopeful it's going to be in my lifetime yeah anyway I, I, I do think within 10 years there, there will be probably majority of businesses will be social enterprises. The rest will be on their way out because they'll, they'll be dying a death. I mean, there's a lot that are already headed that way. So Yeah, so I think so with social enterprises, there's more of a sort of big corporations, more commercially minded organisations who are sort of coming into that uh coming into fold as long as they obviously they have a clear social purpose it's measurable they're not doing it just for some commercial uh mm -hmm. pr mm -hmm. uh more charities having to be entrepreneurial enterprising and i suppose the ultimate litmus test is my is being able to go down the pub with your friends and they tell you what social enterprise is and what social enterprise in their local area is doing and how they bought this from that social enterprise. That would be great to, great to hear.
Well, funnily enough, there is a, a local pub near me that's a CIC, um, that's um, a, a social enterprise pub. They, they bought the um, village, bought it out and run it as a social enterprise. So. Well, let's have, have, have more of those anyway, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Right. Well, thank you so much, Craig. It's been really good talking to you. And um, if people do want to know any more about any of the, any of the things that Craig has talked about, the, his details will be in the comments underneath the video for, for people to get in touch with him. Thank okay. you. My pleasure. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.